good good morning good to see each and every one of you here this morning tonight i would uh, invite everybody to come out at seven o'clock tonight there's going to be a sunday night service tonight at seven there's going to be also prayer tonight from five to six thirty tonight be sure to come out and pray and then there's going to be a bible study called way of the masters and see and it's going to be from starting september the 18th which is tonight and at seven o'clock see Brother James Phelps for that. Uh, game day has been rescheduled for September the 17th. 18th. And also, I mean 18th. Okay. And um, it will also include the uh, Sun School Department picnic. And that is going to be from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and pray for another opportunity to come and worship you. And Father, as we come before you, Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings you give us from day to day. Father, go with those that are sick, those who couldn't be with us, those who are traveling, and Father, touch those who need a miracle, that we turn this service, service on to you, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.
devotional this morning, and I just want to challenge you, whatever has been bombarding your mind, you need to focus on Him. If it's finances, if it's health, if it's family problems, when you focus on Him, He will show you the answer. And he will give you the joy for training our sorrows, right? Yes. So, I was reading in Proverbs 22, 4. It says, laying your life down in tender surrender before the Lord will bring you life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. So, it's more than just our offering because we have to do it. It's part of our tender surrender in him. And I looked up in the Greek what the prosperity was, because I thought, well, maybe that's health and, you know, everything that goes with prosperity. It was actually wealth and riches. But we don't get that because we think he owes it to us. We get that because we lay our life down. So, uh, you can give at tithe.me if you're online, or you can, if you're here in the church, get behind the sound booth or downstairs in the foyer. But I just challenge you to surrender yourselves to Him. Pray what you should give. And not only your offering for your money, but your life, your whole life. And as we continue worship, I just ask you to focus on Him. Let's pray. Lord, I just praise you. And I just ask, Lord, that you help us to focus on you this morning. That you anoint our worship. Not the praise team's worship, but our worship as a body, Lord. Come into this house. We ask you to anoint the word. Lord, help us to get our focus on you and help us to be seen. That we will help us to be encouraged that we want to meet you here. Holy Spirit, just have your way in this building, in this church. And we just praise your name. Amen. Amen. This week, um, when I was preparing worship, somebody happened to send uh, something on Facebook. And I was like, man, this is good. And uh, let me see if I can find it, because I did some screen prints. See if I got it, got it all. Of course, I'm not going to have it all up here. Um, so, in the original Hebrew, they recorded the name of God as Y H W H. No vowels, no vowels at all. Y H W H. Over time, we've arbitrarily us added the A and the E, so it sounds like Yahweh. Presumably because we have a preference for vowels. We don't like to say words without vowels. Um, if you don't think that's true, try to say some without vowels. It's really difficult in our language. But it's Y-H-W-H. Uh, scholars and rabbis have noted that the letters Y-H-W-H represent breathing sounds or aspirated consonants which pronounced without intervening, without the intervening vowels. It actually sounds like breathing. You inhale, ya, and you exhale, way. Ya, and way. So, a baby's first cry, his first breath, speaks the name of God. A deep sigh calls his name. A groan or a gasp that is too heavy for mere words. Come on. The scripture says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Do you think that God left it up to us? Do you really think he left it up to us? God has a plan and a purpose for us. And he said, you will praise me whether or not you want to praise me. You will speak my name. Let everything that have breath praise Yahweh. Yes. Amen. Amen. He is a great God. And that just so moved me. The deepest sinner, the worst sinner, 
He prays in the name of God with his breath. When you are being cursed by someone, they are praising God's name. They can't help it. They think that they may be cursing you, but they are praising God, even though their, their words are awful. Come on. It's good. When someone is building you up, they're not just building you up. They are worshiping God. When you are at your lowest and you are groaning out and crying out to God, you are worshiping him. You see, it's through our worship that we connect deeply with God. And he knew that. So his name is our very breath. He is the breath and life within us. He breathed life into man when he breathed life into Adam. Because he is Yahweh. Stand and worship with us.
Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the presence of God in this house this morning. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible with you this morning, if you would hold it up, we're going to quickly just proclaim that this is the Word of God. I have a, a message that is burning in my heart this morning that the Lord has given to me. And, uh, and, and, I, and I already sense the Spirit moving in this direction, so it's, it's good to watch how God just flows and how God moves. And, and uh, God knows what He's doing. Can I get an amen? amen? If you would, this morning, raise your Bible, repeat after me. This is my Bible. Is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. In Jesus, name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You would remain standing for just one moment. I do. Uh, we are going to be back in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. Uh, if you are following, we have moved from 17 to 18 and now to 19. Uh, and it's amazing how God uh, just flows. And I'm excited uh, about this message this morning. Now, I don't know if you have ever been there. You might be more spiritual than me. You might be more connected with the Lord than me. But I want to preach on, for just a few moments, on the thought of, God, I can't do this anymore. How many can already feel that? You see, there are times when we reach... Uh, places in our life, and I don't want to start preaching yet, but, but this is true, where we feel like we can't go any farther and do any more. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Let's read this this morning. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Can you repeat that with me? It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him. Can you say that with me? An angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there was by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him. Can you say, and the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord touched, him again touched him again and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food, Forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. Father God, we thank you for this word. Lord, we already sense the moving of the Holy Spirit. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, that they would be pleasing to you. Lord, we uh, have already said that this is your word, that it is life transforming and changing. And so we receive that into our heart and lives. God, I pray that you would give me the anointing. God, the utterance and the unctioning power of your spirit. 
God, that this might be a word of God for the people of God. And we all give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you would uh, look at your neighbor and just say, Help that pastor preach. What does that mean? That means help me preach this morning. That means uh, don't make me ask for an amen. Uh, just just uh, shout me down, if you will. Now, the first thing I want to say is sometimes some messages aren't meant to be a shouting message, but they are truth. Can I get an amen this morning? Uh, and Ahab, look at this scripture. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Hmm. Don't you just hate a tattletale? I mean, here's Ahab, the king of Israel, and he goes and tells his little wife all that uh, Elijah had done. What a weak and pathetic leader King Ahab was. His wife Jezebel, how many, by raising a hand, have ever heard of a Jezebel spirit? Many times we teach this wrong, and what it simply is, is a spirit that tries to take authority over who should be the leader. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man, there can be a Jezebel spirit that wants to take authority over the situation. And Jezebel had done that very thing. And we look at this scripture, and Ahab goes to his wife, and he begins to tell her, you know those prophets that you appointed? And those prophets of Baal, the ones that you liked so much uh, because they were uh, professing the religion from Sidonia, from where you're from. You know that? You know those, those prophets? Excuse me. <coughs> Honey, they're all dead. They're gone. Elijah has had them slain. You had to be there, honey. The fire fell from heaven and consumed uh, the, uh, the, the, the sacrifice upon the altar. And all it did was enrage Jezebel, and she threatens the man of God. Now look where Elijah was. He had prayed, and the rain stopped. Face-to-face -face confrontation with Ahab. He had prayed that the little widow woman who took care of him, her son, revived and came back to life. He had prayed and fire fell from heaven. He had prayed and the rain after a three and a half year hiatus had started again. And then Here's Elijah, he's 
fearful. He's afraid. Fear grips his heart, and he does not know what to do. So he does what he can do. Elijah must have been a marathon runner. He runs for his life to a place where Ahab had no authority. Can I tell you that you currently live in a place, if you know the Lord is your Savior, where Ahab, the enemy, really has no authority. He's not in charge, though he thinks he is. And he has no authority, but many times we don't just recognize that. Look at your neighbor and say, the devil has no authority over me. Charles Spurgeon said this of Elijah. He who was the most courageous of all men fled from an angry woman. Women, you don't know the power you have. Elijah was afraid, but he was also discouraged. Anybody ever been discouraged? Discouraged means having lost confidence or enthusiasm. Disheartened with the situation. Anybody ever been discouraged in your life? Yes. Every hand in the building ought to be raised if you are human in any way. Yeah. You have been discouraged. You have had a lack of courage, a lack of joy in your life, a lack of every one of us. Is anybody out there this morning? Amen. So Elijah was discouraged. He thought that surely the fire falling from Mount Carmel would change the spiritual coincidences, the spiritual atmosphere of the country, that it would uh, bring everyone back to the Lord, including the political regime of Ahab and Jezebel. But it didn't. It didn't happen. So what did Elijah do? He ran. And he went into the wilderness. There's something about the wilderness and leaders in the Bible. And he secludes himself. But can I tell you, it's not always good to be alone. We look at Elijah, and the first time that God speaks to him and says, pray that there be no rain, he says, go to Cherith, and there hide by the brook. Be alone with God. Get energized and get uh, ready for what I'm calling you to do. But here, Elijah takes it upon himself, and he goes and hides, and he secludes himself. And there are times when we don't need to be alone. Can I get an amen? There are times when we need the help of our brothers and our sisters in Christ. God did not create us to be alone in all of this. We're not designed. God looked at Adam and the one thing in all of creation that he said was not good was that Adam was alone. Elijah, discouraged, runs and hides. He's depressed. He's discouraged. And he prays that he would die. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? Extremely discouraged. And many times when we get discouraged, there are reasons why we get discouraged. Some of them true, and some of them a figment of our imagination. For when we are in an emotional state, we don't always think clearly. Now, some of this is very practical, but you'll see some of, it, of this is spiritual aspect of the thing as well. So why was Elijah discouraged? Because it, to him it was apparent that he had failed. It looked like his mission had come up short, that everything that he had done was in vain. That the very purpose of his struggle and his life appeared to be ending in failure. Anybody ever been there before? When it feels like the whole world is against you, 
when it feels like there's no way that you can accomplish what God has called you to do. And if you think your pastor is exempt from this kind of feeling, I want you to know that sometimes it hits me and sometimes I let it stay on me longer than it ought to. But there comes a time that you've got to shake it off. Amen? Amen? There comes a time that you've got to move forward. We see that Elijah will eventually move forward. But Elijah was also struggling with emotional loneliness. He felt all alone. Nobody else, God, is serving you. That's what he said. Nobody else. I alone am a prophet of God. Everybody else has abandoned you, God. That's literally the way Elijah is speaking to him. And it's not unfamiliar feelings, for Paul had similar feelings. While in prison, Paul wrote, At my first defense, no one came to stand beside me. All deserted me. And we know that's not really true, but that's what he felt. Look at your neighbor and say he was in his feels. Sometimes your feelings are not true. Sometimes you've got to bypass your feelings and understand what has God truly told me. What has he promised me? What has God said that uh, is going to happen in my life? He was lonely. Nobody's trying to serve you like I am God. Why do I even try? That's where he's at in his life. But beyond that, he was physically exhausted. Now, we underplay this because we think in the spirit. But can I tell you, you cannot flow in the spirit if you are so exhausted. If you have overdone it. How many ever overdone it? If you have overextended yourself. And if you have not. anointed thing you do, put that up there, Pastor Jason, is take a nap. It's true. I try to do my best at that. When life gets too hard, sometimes just a nap will change your attitude. Isn't that the truth? Sometimes just get enough sleep. I don't know if I was exhausted last night. I know I was a little bit tired. And my wife might have, must have been too, because I woke up at 9.45 p.m. and went back to bed, and my wife was already asleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is to get enough rest. Yes, amen. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I gave you permission to rest. And so Elijah says, it is enough. It's been a long and rough journey, God. My body and my mind are at its limits. I have done everything that I can do and everything that I know to do. God, I can't do this anymore. Anybody can relate to that. Uh, God, I just can't go any farther. It's too stressful. It's too exhausting. It seems I've accomplished nothing. Amen. See, can I give you those of us who have a deep desire, and you should, to see people get saved and want for the Lord, is that sometimes people don't take your good advice. Amen. Ever been there? And they go off and they do their own thing because they're hard-headed. And they can't learn from your mistakes. And so sometimes people don't get saved even though you give them the best of you and the best information. And you've witnessed to them and you've done all that God has called you to do. Sometimes people won't come to the Lord. And it is discouraging. Because you know what you got. And God's been better to you. That anybody has ever been to you. 
We've all felt like giving up. We've all felt like throwing in the towel. What did Elijah do? He ate and he slept. He got the needed rest and replenishment. He was speaking out of despair and discouragement. Or just let me die. That's extreme. Aren't you glad for some unanswered prayers? Oh, Lord. God, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't go any farther. God, uh, I'm done with all of it. Peace out, God. I just don't want to do anymore. God, just take your calling from me and call me on to heaven. I can't do this anymore, God. But God knows the extremes of what you are called to do. And he will let you get your rest and he will let you eat, eat and recuperate and replenish because he knows there is something. I'm speaking to somebody this morning. Greater ahead for you. So get your rest and get ready for God is getting ready to do something mighty and powerful through you and through the anointing that he has placed upon your life. can't do this. Paul said, I have a desire to depart, to be with Christ, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. What is he saying? I want to die more than I want to live. That's what Paul said. But nevertheless, because it's better for you, I'm going to stay. It's better for the world that you stay if God's not done with you. God's called you to do something mighty in the kingdom of God. No matter how inferior you feel, no matter if it feels like you have failed, no matter how emotional you may be, God has still called you to do something in the kingdom of God. That's good preaching, Pastor Brian. Amen. Hallelujah. Here's the amazing thing. The angel didn't say, oh, come on now, Elijah. You know you can go a little farther. You know you can do a little more. No, the angel said, I agree with you. You can't do any more. Do you get it? You cannot do any more. So the angel did what? Touched him. Touched him. The angel come from, the, probably the, it was the angel of the Lord that you hear about later on. Is the angel of the Lord. The incarnate presence of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it touches him. And it empowers him. And it goes to sleep again. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is get back in the bed. Wow. Now, don't go to sleep on me this morning. They'll know I can give you permission to. And he touches him. And he strengthens him. The angel is in agreement. Elijah had to learn, just like we do, that it is not by my power, nor by my strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit. But my spirit, says the Lord. The angel of the Lord touches him. And the best thing that we can ever do is recognize that we need a touch from God. Amen. Yes, Lord. Lord, I need a touch. Yes. I mean, can, can, can we just right now? Yes. Can we just right now just say, Lord, I, I need a touch. I, I need some strength. I need some emotional support. God, I need you to touch my body and my mind and my spirit. I need you to encourage me, Lord. I need you to encourage the members of this church, God. For we know that we have a great calling, a great witness in this last day. We know that this church is called uh, to do greater and more abundant things, God. But we need a touch from you, Lord. Touch us, God. Touch us. Touch us. Give us... Not only the physical things that we need, but the spiritual things. 
so that we can complete the mission. Here's the good news. God knows how to take care of his children. He does. Isn't that good news? God is not surprised when you are too tired to be any good. Woo. He knows you. He designed you. He created you. Uh, and, and I'm a firm believer that that's why you'll see this pastor, although I've met some who say, oh, I've never taken a vacation. I never go do anything. No, that is wrong, my friends. It is time that we nourish the physical body in order that the spirit might move and do what God wants to do through us. We are humans. We need the rest, the recuperation. Not forever, but for a time. Twice Elijah eats and then goes to sleep. That must have been some good filling food. How many ever just ate so much of Thanksgiving? It's like, honey, I just got to take a nap. You know, uh, I, I, I love the, uh, the, the way that God treats Elijah here. Elijah was a mighty man of God. And he gets up from this, and he travels for 40 days and 40 nights, a 200-mile trip yeah. on two meals. Woo! How many want some of that kind of thing? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. A mighty man of miracles, but he was not exempt from his own trials. But here's where it gets really good. But once he gets up, God sends him to a certain place, Mount Horeb. And when you look at that, you think, I don't know those mountains over there. What is that mountain? What does that mean? It's the same place as Mount Sinai. I mean, I've heard of that. Where the very power and presence of God comes down upon the mountain, lightnings and thunders. Moses goes up into the mountain and God communicates with him and God gives him the commandments and the law. What a powerful thing. Elijah exhausted to the extreme of it. Has to be touched by the Lord two times. Eat and sleep two times. But when he gets up, he has been empowered not only physically but spiritually. And he is on his way Thank you. 
with you yet. There's a friend God has not done with you yet. Chris, God's not done with you yet. Mr. and Mrs. Gregory, God's not done with you yet. Mr. and Mrs. Phelps, 